Okay. Thanks, uh, Fanny. Uh, thanks um, for the invitation. And um, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm sure I'll see you all uh, soon enough, though. So, um, so I'm talking about some joint work with uh, Raphael Ducaté and Alice Guionet. Uh, okay, so just um, to put in a general context, I'll review some uh, basic facts about uh, what's known about the spectrum of, of Wigner matrices. Um, are actually sorry if if you still have the mic. Are you able to see my uh, my cursor moving? Yes, yes, we can uh, we can see your mouse. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, so so I'm going to write um, let H be a normalized real Wigner matrix. Just uh, matrices are real in this talk. Uh, so that means that uh, it's symmetric. The entries, uh, well, they're based, they're, they're IID except for a slightly different scaling on the diagonal. I scale by root two on the diagonal and uh, we're normalizing by root N so that the whole spectrum is at scale one. And I label the eigenvalues uh, in decreasing order uh, like this. And I'll write um, mu for the, the common distribution of these, um, these unscaled entries, uh, xij. OK, so with, with, this, uh, with this scaling, the, the empirical spectral distribution um, converges to the semicircle measure, which I write by uh, sigma. Um, so, okay, so we have uh, quantitative versions of this. So for instance, if I have a test function f that's uh, convex in Lipschitz, and if the, if the entries uh, have uh, bounded support, then I get this uh, exponential concentration with speed n squared. So this is a consequence of Talegrand's inequality uh, that was shown by Guillaume and Zaituni. Um, you can drop the uh, convexity assumption if they have a log Sobolev inequality, um, or you know you can use this and approximate more general test functions by linear combinations of of uh, convex functions and apply truncation arguments and lose just a little bit in the speed, um, but you still get pretty good uh, concentration for 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 Lipschitz uh, uh, for for uh, for Lipschitz functions. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the fluctuations of uh, test functions of these uh, linear statistics is consistent with the speed n squared. So if you, if you scale by n, um, then, uh, then this uh, linear statistic converges to a Gaussian if the function is, is smooth enough. Uh, and so it was only just, so, so, so there's, okay, well, this general statement is, it's, uh, um, pretty classical now, but it was only just this past year that um, the optimal, essentially optimal regularity condition um, for, for the CLT with, without um, uh, scaling the variance, uh, without rescaling was established uh, by Ben Landon and, and Phil Sosway. Okay, um, and then uh, what's... Um, what we know less about, what we have in the GOE case, is a large deviation principle at this same speed n squared. So, uh, so Ben Arus and Guillaume showed uh, that um, when these x, when mu is the standard Gaussian measure, then okay. So I don't. It's not a fully precise statement, but okay. So the the the, the probability that the empirical spectral distribution lies in a tiny uh, neighborhood, so in in the weak topology of um, of a uh, of a fixed measure nu, uh, is exponential uh, with rate n squared, and we have a rate function uh, which is given by this uh, difference of a second moment and this 
and this uh, logarithmic capacity. Okay, and, and a certain constant c, which, which just makes this zero if, if nu is the semicircle measure. Okay, but that's just known in the GOE case. Okay, so, so that's uh, so, um, the empirical spectral distribution, and, th and that's still open, um, but what I'm talking about today is, con is uh, some progress about uh, the edge of the spectrum, so, so the, um, say, the rightmost eigenvalue, lambda 1. So, uh, so typically, lambda 1 is, is concentrating around 2, um, so the convergence to 2 was, was established by Firidi and, and Komlos in 81. Uh, the sharp moment condition, fourth moment condition, was established by Bai and Yin. Um, okay, so again, with Tyler-Grand's inequality, you can get a nice um, quantitative tail estimate of this form, uh, where, where we now have a speed n. Um, so, so it turns out, uh, so, so unlike in the uh, empirical spectral distribution case, this, this uh, straightforward sort of concentration um, doesn't actually capture the true order of fluctuations. So, uh, so, so it's a bit smaller. Uh, and, and, and so if you scale up by n to the two thirds, then you get convergence to uh, tracy Woodham law. So, so this was uh, established for the GOE and then, and then uh, um, the general case by Sloshnikov. And then, uh, and then we also have an LDP for the GOE case uh, by Benarus, Dembo, and Guionet. Now we have the speed n. So, so here we're looking at, um, again, so we're, we're, we're looking at uh, large deviations at the scale of the bulk. So, so, so lambda one's going to two, and then we consider uh, arbitrary fixed x, and we have a rate function um, uh, with this neat formula. Okay, so so obviously from the um, from the result about the convergence of empirical spectral distributions, deviations to the left would entail a, a deviation of the empirical spectral distribution, and that has speed n squared. So at, so at this at, the, at this speed n, the rate function has to be infinity uh, if x is less than two. Um, but then when x is at least two, we we have we have this formula. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, different expressions for this formula later. Okay. All right, so, uh, so uh, in the last few years, so, um, so, so just uh, a few years ago, there was this, uh, this last result was extended um, uh, to get um, a, a kind of universality result. Um, by Guionet and, and Usson. Uh, and, you know, it's really surprising to, you don't see universality so often in large deviations theory. Um, so, you know, usually uh, statistics of, of independent random variables in, in, in the large deviation regime are going to depend on details about the tails of those random variables. Um, but it's very interesting that for a wide class of measures mu that includes the Gaussian, uh, we actually get the same answer as in the Gaussian case. Uh, so what is this class? So, so I'll write L mu for the uh, log Laplace transform of the measure mu. So it's so a well, two-sided two Laplace transform, so the, the, the log moment generating function. And um, okay, so it's, it's a standard fact that, um, uh, you know, so that, uh, if mu is centered, then being sub-Gaussian, you know, having sub-Gaussian tails is, uh, is equivalent to the finiteness of this long Laplace, uh, Laplace transform um, at all t. Um, okay, so, and we say uh, that, um, uh, um, so this terminology was introduced by Guillaume and Usson. A slightly stronger condition, a stronger condition is that um, is that uh, mu be sharp sub Gaussian, and by this we mean that the uh, 
the Laplace transform is actually bounded pointwise by that of the Gaussian. So, so here I write gamma, uh, gamma is for Gaussian, the Gaussian measure. And uh, the log Laplace transform for the Gaussian measure is just one half T squared. And we say mu is sharp sub Gaussian if we have this pointwise bound. Um, and it's it's uh, it's not too restrictive. I mean, so so you know it it contains perhaps the 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 other most important distribution, the the Rademacher distribution, uh, as well as the uniform distribution. Um, okay, scaled so that we have uh, variance one. Uh, and their result is that you get the uh, the same um, large deviation principle as in the Gaussian case for this general class. So we have a speed n and this uh, rate function i gamma. So so I'll generally write i mu for you know the if if we get an LDP with this entry distribution mu, I'll write i mu. Um, and the theorem says that i mu is actually equal to i gamma if we assume uh, the um, sharp sub Gaussian condition. Okay, so 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 I just write it this way that this uh, the tail at speed n is uh, to leading order given by by this, where we have um, an error that goes to zero when uh, n is taken to infinity and then delta to zero. Okay. Okay, and you can you know you can get a quantitative error from their proof. It's it's not bad. Okay, so so this was a major breakthrough, um, and it it was uh, very influential because they had a, a a nice strategy that's been applied in uh, to other models since then. Uh, so this is a strategy I'll explain uh, a bit later called um, it's a, it's a strategy of tilting by uh, what are known as spherical integrals, and this has been uh, this was soon after applied to uh, other models. Um, Okay, such as the sum of Hermitian matrices, where the second is conjugated by a Haar unitary. Um, okay, so I um, I believe Guillenet and Maida were looking at extreme eigenvalues, and Belinsky, Guillenet, and Huang were looking at um, the uh, empirical spectral distribution. Um, I should say also Jonathan Husson applied this to matrices with a variance profile. Um, and uh, okay, so so that's for the sharp sub Gaussian condition. Uh, for general sub Gaussian, this is is what we've worked on, and uh, was also um, some progress was made by uh, Augeri, Guillenet, and Usson. Um, this the 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 answer though that uh, we we find that the answer is more complicated in the in the general sub Gaussian case, um, and this is because. Uh, once the tails are a bit heavier, uh, then you get some non-universal answers. Uh, it kind of depends on on what the what the tails of the entries are like, uh, and this opens up the possibility for sort of um, various localization phenomena uh, that give rise to the large eigenvalue, or at least that uh, contribute to it being large. Okay. Um, so before explaining that, I'll, I'll um, review progress that's been made on other uh, Hermitian matrices, so, so not in the sub-Gaussian category. Um, so, so there's been a lot of progress in recent years also on matrices that, uh, so Hermitian matrices with, that um, uh, they don't have sub-Gaussian entries, but they are um, either sparse or have uh, heavy tailed entries. Um, or, or for looking at deviations that are very far from the bulk, so not at the scale of the bulk, but going away from the bulk. Um, and, and in these, these in these models where a lot of progress has happened, um, the common theme is that the the uh, the large deviations of the um, edge eigenvalues are governed by uh, what I call localization phenomena. Uh, so, so these are deviations uh, involving entries on um, little o of n squared entries. Okay, so so for the um, uh, the Guillenet-Usson result, 
um, the proof kind of shows that the, de the deviations are due to sort of all of the entries sort of working together and you it's a sort of delocalized uh, mechanism um, whereas for these results it's um it's a completely a, a localization phenomenon okay so for instance if you look at uh, matrices in the same normalization we've been looking at except that uh, the entries have stretched exponential tails uh, so so they rather than you know going like T squared say they go like T to the alpha for alpha smaller than two. Um, then, uh, so there's work of Bordenov and Caputo on the on the empirical spectral distribution and of Augery on the on the um, uh, the on lambda one. And they they proved large deviation principles and 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 showed that the the mechanism for large deviations is, is the appearance of, of large entries in the matrix. Okay, um, there's been a lot of work lately on eigenvalues um, and more general polynomial statistics uh, for adjacency matrices of sparse random graphs. Um, so this has mostly been motivated by getting large deviation principles or joint large deviation principles for, for subgraph counts in, in the graphs. And for those really, um, you know, if you're looking at large deviations of say cycle counts uh, at, at the scale of um, the, the, the mean for cycle counts, uh, um, LDPs really um, are governed by deviations of the eigenvalues at the scale of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue, which is at, at scale NP. So, so I'm looking at GNP, so N vertices, um, and the, the entries are Bernoulli P with P going to zero. Um, okay, so the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue is, is typically at NP. And then uh, we're interested in the deviations of, of uh, that, that eigenvalue at that scale. Uh, and a few other eigenvalues, perhaps, also at that scale, where, whereas their typical scale is, is at this sort of square root NP scale. Okay, so these are, it's, it's I mean, you know, technically they're sub-Gaussian, but the, we've got this parameter P going to zero, so there's sort of more like heavy tail phenomena, and we're looking away from the bulk, we're going away from the bulk. So it's kind of a different regime, uh, but again, it's important for understanding deviations of subgraph counts. Uh, and it, here again, we get um, localization phenomena are really what's responsible. Uh, there's sort of the dry, driving mechanism. Um, you can't have large, you know, the entries can't be too large because they're Bernoulli, uh, but you have the appearance of very small, dense, sort of low rank structures, which in the graph correspond to uh, sort of dense subgraphs like cliques or uh, a high degree vertex. Um, and th these are sort of involving um, on the order of n squared p squared edges. Okay, so so this says, uh, okay, so so Amir and I got a, a sort of LDP type result, and then a more explicit tail was worked out by um, Bhattacharya and Ganguly. And then, uh, and that was for p, I think, going down to something like n to the minus a half. And then for smaller p, um, Anurban uh, more recently completely worked out the. Uh, uh, the, the shape of the tail. Uh, and there's an interesting transition between, you know, the clique being the gov governing mechanism or, or a high degree vertex. Okay. Um, and then for even smaller P, say, you know, order one over N, um, the, the deviations were shown to be completely governed by the degree sequence uh, by Bhattacharya, Bhattacharya and Ganguly. Um, okay, and then there was also a, a sort of general LDP of, of Chatterjee and Varadhan um, for, um, for a general class of random matrices um, that includes these. Uh, but again, it was for deviations at the scale of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue. Um, okay, and again, it's, you know, from that you can sort of work out this sort of um, low rank localization picture. Okay, and then there's sort of um, some interesting work on hybrid, uh, sort of hybrid um, 
you know, combination of these last two bullet points where you, you, uh, you look at random networks. So you have an adjacency matrix for an erdos renyi graph, and then you put random weights, uh, Y, I, J. Uh, and they can be Gaussian or straight stretch exponential tails. And then you, don't, you, know, you have sort of two kinds of things going on at the same time. You have you know, uh, uh, the appearance of some structured sort of support like a clique perhaps. Um, but then on that clique, you can also wonder if, if the, uh, the entries themselves are gonna somehow uh, become large sort of in, a, in, a, um, in unison. Okay, so that's that's an interesting problem, but I think we're going to hear about that uh, from um, I, so so I believe uh, Nam is going to talk about this, and 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 also Fanny uh, will talk about some of these models. Okay, all right. So so back to sub Gaussian matrices. So in our work with Raphael and Alice, uh, we are. We are, um, so, so I'll put a further assumption. So we're gonna look at symmetric laws. So from now on mu is this distribution mu for the entries is symmetric about zero. And uh, so recall that uh, L mu of T is the log Laplace transform. Um, and uh, deviations really depend on uh, the growth of L mu of T in comparison to uh, the, the Gaussian log Laplace transform, which is one half T squared. Uh, okay, so it's convenient to define this function psi, which is the, which is the quotient of these two. Um, all right, so psi is identically a half for the Gaussian measure. Um, and in fact, for any measure, since this is standardized, it's, uh, this is one half at, at zero. Um, okay, all right, so, um, and the, the answers are gonna depend on three parameters. Uh, so we have, we write psi max for the global maximum of this function. So this is finite by the sub-Gaussian assumption. Um, and this would be a half uh, if it were sharp sub-Gaussian. Um, okay, for some, distributions, uh, the uh, infimum of, of this uh, function is positive, and for some it's zero, and that'll be important. Uh, and then uh, we write uh, psi infinity for the, uh, the limb soup. Um, although in most, well, in, in all examples that you, you can write down, it's kind of hard to, to, to work out examples where the, the limit itself doesn't exist, but, but the, the, the you know, you can construct examples. Okay, so for instance, uh, for the Gaussian measure gamma, uh, all of these parameters are a half because psi is just a constant one half. Uh, for the Rademacher distribution, so remember this is sharp sub Gaussian. And in fact, this curve uh, psi, it has its, its, um, uh, its maximum at zero and then it decreases to zero. Uh, so psi min in this case is zero, and that's also equal to the limit at infinity, and psi max is at zero, and, that, and that's a half. Okay, but it stays below a half in particular, so it's sharp sub-Gaussian. Um, so those distributions are covered by the Guillaume-Usson result. Um, a couple of examples that you might like to keep in mind that are are not covered by the result, their result, but but which we can say things about are um, uh, the sparsified versions of these distributions. Uh, so the the entries could be of of this form, say, where you have a Gaussian and then you multiply by an independent Bernoulli variable, uh, and then we have to to rescale to make it uh, uh, standardized. Okay, so so when p is less than one, then this isn't that this is uh, well for p fixed, it's it's sub Gaussian. For p less than one, it's it's not sharp sub Gaussian uh, because the maximum is um, one over two p, and in fact this um, this curve psi is increasing. Uh, so at zero, it takes the value half, and then it increases up to its asymptotic value of one over two p. 
Um, you can do the same with the Rademacher distribution. Uh, just um, randomly set it to zero and, and scale by one over root p. Uh, and in this case, um, so it's it's not increasing. It actually increases up to some maximum value uh, and then decreases to zero. Okay, so psi infinity is zero, and but psi max is is larger than a half. Okay, so in this this maximum is achieved at a unique point um, t depending on p, um, and I believe that it's it's achieved at zero if p is above some threshold. Um, uh, no. Okay, no, I don't remember. All right, yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't remember about, uh, about how this um, parameter behaves. Okay, all right, so, so those are a few examples to keep in mind. All right, so, so in this work of um, Augeri, Guillaume, and Eusson, and, and our work, uh, what we can do is, in many cases, we can show the existence of a limiting rate function. Um, uh, okay, so so I just sort of say a, a weak LDP type statement here. I mean, we have exponential tightness, so so we get actual LDPs, full LDPs. Um, okay, so so we can show that you know LDPs with speed n, um, and and some some rate function depending on mu. Uh, in some cases, we can give a sort of formula for it. Um, and in some, some, in some, we don't. We just know it exists. Okay, and and this always denotes some error uh, that tends to zero when uh, when n goes to infinity and then delta goes down to zero when when x is fixed. Um, so I won't say uh, precise results right now. I'll just describe some. Uh, so one thing we know is that this um, this rate function is always at uh, it's bounded above by by that of the Gaussian. Uh, so deviations are at least as likely as in the Gaussian case. Um, and you can think of that as sort of um, these sort of delocalized mechanisms for deviations are still available. Uh, but once the tails are a bit heavier, you sort of get some new some new possibilities open up the um, some new localization strategies open up. So so the um, so there's sort of more ways to have large deviations. So the the tails, uh, this this um, the probability is at least as likely. So the rate function is bounded above, um, and we can actually show that uh, the rate function is equal to that of the Gaussian in a neighborhood of two. So so at, uh, you know going to the right from two. I mean, of course, they're equal to the left of two. They're infinity, uh, but going from the right to the right from two, uh, they actually match for a little while. Um, okay, and it'll, you know, how, how far they match will depend on, on mu. Um, okay, so, so this, uh, so, so a sort of partial result, I think uh, assuming psi max was a, below some, some threshold like one, uh, what was already established by, um, uh, in this previous work, and, and we we um, remove that hypothesis. So this actually holds in general. Um, it's we can say more th more explicit things if um, if psi is increasing. So uh, such as in the sparse Gaussian case, um, but it, so if psi is increasing or if it achieves its maximum at some finite um, point t star. Uh, then, then, then we get this for all for all x. Um, when it's increasing, we can get a, a sort of a cleaner formula. Um, in 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 uh, in the in the latter case, it's we just sort of know it exists just by sort of um, taking a limit of some independent functions that turn out to be monotone, uh, but we don't have a, a nice a, well. It's not. You'll see the formula for the increasing case. So I, I wouldn't call it a nice formula, but. We don't even have that for the for this um, for the latter case. Um, okay, and uh, right, well, so all of these cases it, it, in our work, we deduce them from uh, um, our main technical result, 
that gives um, a non-asymptotic approximation for this tail uh, in terms of an optimization problem involving um, spherical integrals and uh, what's the so-called annealed free energy. So, so this is again this this already was in the work of Guillaume and Rousson, um, but our innovation is to actually capture the tail in terms not of the full annealed free energy, but what we call the re restricted annealed free energies. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. And if you, if you have any questions, feel free to stop. Uh, uh, I think you need to get the mic for that. But. Okay. All right, so um, so now I want to to um, um, talk about this uh, tilting strategy the, to to describe this strategy of tilting by spherical integrals, and to to uh, sort of convey um, to give some idea of how we modify this to capture these localization phenomena. Um, but I think a, a good place to start. Um, just for comparison, is to go back to the classic tilting argument for the sample mean. Uh, so, so this is the LDP for the sample mean of Cromer, which is uh, classical. So, okay, so I'll, I'll again say that, you know, we, we have some IID variables with the common distribution mu, and I write X bar for their sample mean. And you can show something like this, so, so you know, this I'll sort of write LDPs in, in this sort of form. And in this sketch, I'm gonna be a bit, um, so little o1 is gonna be, these will be errors that tend to zero uh, when you take n to infinity and then delta to zero. So, so this just helps keep things a bit um, cleaner for this, uh, for these sketches. Okay, and in this rate, in this, um, uh, in this theorem, the rate function is given by the uh, um, the um, uh, Legendre transform of of the uh, log moment generating function. Okay, so so the proof is you can say it pretty quickly. Um, the key is to look at uh, consider tilted measures. So to to tilt the probability measure to reweight it by this exponential factor. So the uh, the exponential of the variable you're interested in, um, okay, at the speed you're interested in, and and we include a a, a tilting parameter theta. So we we have this one parameter family of tilted measures. Um, okay, and this normalization here because these guys are IID with common distribution. That's just you can just express that in terms of the Laplace transform in that way. So uh, you can, in terms of these tilted measures, you can re-express this thing you're interested in. Um, okay, well, so th this, this, this step here is obvious. I'm just multiplying and dividing by the same thing. And then, uh, so then what you can do is, is this, this exponential factor in the denominator, uh, since we're restricting to an event where X bar is essentially determined up to a small error, you can pull it out. So x bar is essentially little x. And so we, we can pull out e to the minus n theta x. Uh, and so, so then we're left with this. Um, we can re-express this in terms of these tilted measures. So just um, multiplying and dividing by e to the n times the um, log Laplace transform. And so, um, and so, what we have now is is uh, this is essentially the the answer once you optimize in theta, uh, and then we have this this factor, which is the probability of our tail event now under the tilted measures. So uh, to get the upper bound in the theorem, you can just bound that second factor trivially by one, and then optimize in theta. Okay, take logs and divide by n, and, and that's the answer. Okay, and you know, and, and I'm also in this in these sketches, I'll skip, you know, how 
you know, we're optimizing in theta, but you also have a potentially theta dependent error and, and I'll just completely or ignore is these issues of uniformity. Um, for the lower bound, um, what you need to do is show that uh, this, this upper bound was actually um, not far from the truth, at least at, the, at, this, at this optimizing value. So, so when we optimize theta, you, you, you pick one that, de that depends on x. And at that optimizer, uh, what you need to show is that this tilted, that the large deviation event under this tilted measure is, is uh, not unlikely. Um, I mean, often, so in this case, it turns out to be likely, but really, you know, for the theorem, you just need it to be sub-exponentially small or, or super exponentially small. So it's, you know, e to the little o n. Okay, and and the, and that's uh, that's the proof. Okay, so this this is kind of standard because it's just, you know, you can compute the variance under the tilted measure, and get some easy concentration, uh, and and that's the uh, proof of the Cromer LDP. Okay, so um, so we're we're gonna do something like this. So Guillaume and Usson did something like this um, for uh, for the largest eigenvalue. So, so what did we do? So, so when we reweighted by this exponential factor um, at this critical parameter theta x, this uh, tail event becomes typical. So that, that was sort of the key. And this suggests a general strategy for, for large deviations of tilting by this exponential moment. Um, but you know, in, in general, this doesn't really lead to any progress. I mean, it's kind of just as hard. Um, I mean, you know, that, that slide, the previous slide was just one slide. So <clears throat> by, by that same one slide argument, they're essentially equivalent problems. Um, what, you know, it was key for us there that this function of the independent variables was linear. And so, so that we could easily compute this, this exponential moment. But um, it's not really clear how to compute this exponential moment for the largest eigenvalue. So uh, we, what we do is, is we, we need to think a bit more generally. So the, there was sort of a coincidence in Cromer's theorem that uh, what we wanted, what, what ends up being the good sort of tilting function is the exponential of the variable itself. That, but that was, that was a coincidence. In general, you can consider reweighting by some um, other function of the, so now I'm talking about the matrix, <clears throat> some other family of functions, uh, which sort of depend in a nice way, they, they, they sort of depend on the top eigenvalue, so you can sort of use them to learn about deviations of lambda one, um, but you can also compute this. Um, and so Guillaume and Usson found just the right function uh, for, for this task. Um, this is what we um, what are known as spherical integrals. So uh, so this this uh, a spherical integral. So th so this applies for a deterministic matrix H, um, and we have a parameter theta. So this is just the um, uh, exponential moment. Um, so so here we're integrating e to the theta n, and then we have this uh, quadratic form u h u where u is integrated um, with respect to the uniform surface measure on the sphere. So this, um, if you like, is the, the partition function for the spherical SK model. Um, so we borrow some of that terminology. So um, this is a great choice for the sort of reweighting function for, for two reasons. So, um, two, two good, uh, we, we have two good reasons for this. So the first thing, um, as I said, is this, this function indeed essentially depends in a nice way on lambda one, so, so that you can learn about lambda one by, 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 by um, reweighting by this function. Um, okay, at least outside of a negligible sort of bad event. So for, you know, in particular, you need to sort of restrict to an event where the spectrum is concentrated tightly around the semicircle measure but that, of course, is uh, we can do because that happens at speed n squared. 
so so the the bad event there is is completely negligible um okay and there's there's uh, some other things um but you know I, I won't describe this bad event um um uh, okay, but you know, so once you do that, once you uh, have fixed, you know, the largest eigenvalue being some near some some x, and you have the empirical spectral distribution concentrating around the semicircle distribution, uh, then on this event, the the uh, the spherical integral um, has this uh, this nice formula. Okay, so so at the exponential scale. Uh, you have this, so it, it turns out that this is continuously differentiable across the uh, this um, this threshold here. Okay, well, it's, so we have this formula, um, and so you see that for theta above this th this threshold, it, it depends uh, sort of in a in a nice regular way on x. Okay, and this threshold is in terms of the Stilts transform of the semicircle measure. Okay. All right. Um, the other side of why this is a good thing to do to tilt by is that uh, you can compute the um, the expectation. Uh, so, so you, in the spin glass terminology, this is the annealed free energy. Um, so, you know, unlike for just the exponential moment of the of lambda one itself. Um, this you can sort of get your hands on. You can at least see how you can start to get your hands on it, just because uh, you know from Frubini you can just take the expectation inside, and then uh, you know the entries of H are independent, and so this this right here is a linear. This is linear in the entries of H, and and so this factorizes into um, a bunch of Laplace transforms of the entries evaluated at you know points depending on you so you can sort of you're sort of well on your way at that point um and in the sharp sub gaussian case it's it's not too hard to actually estimate it turns out to be pretty hard in the, in the general sub gaussian case um but uh okay but at least we're sort of on our way okay so what so so how do they how do they do this tilting so so now, um, now since we're we're tilting by something that's itself sort of an expectation over a, a random vector u, um, okay, which is sort of independent of the matrix. So there's kind of two levels of tilting happening. So I have two two different families of tilted measures here that we that we're going to work with for a fixed uh, choice of theta and a fixed choice of u. We have these tilted measures on the probability space where we're reweighting re by this the exponential of this uh, quadratic form expression, and then we also define these tilted measures on the sphere, which are reweighting by this um, spherical in well I'm sorry this uh, this uh, expectation itself by this exponential moment. Uh, okay, so that's for fixed u. And the normalizing factor here, you see, is is uh, is just is nothing but um, uh, one over this, the the uh, annealed free energy, um, or sorry, one over the uh, expected um, spherical integral. So this is e to the minus n times the free energy. Okay, so we have these two tilted measures, and so now we can. So this will be kind of like in Kermer's theorem. Um, so we can uh, estimate this probability. We, you know, so we multiply and divide by this uh, tilting factor. As I said, so so the in the, the, the this this function is essentially determined. You know, okay. So I'm 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 not sort of intersecting with a a good event, but you can you know sort of keep in mind that I'm actually also carrying around a good event where we concentrate around the um, the semicircle measure. And so then that means that the spherical integral is essentially uh, determined by this expression I had on the previous slide. So this is by this result of, uh, you can get this from a, this result of MIDA. And then, uh, okay, so then we have this factor and then we can uh, apply Fubini's theorem, um, 
So I, I don't have a, a year for, the, for that result, roughly 1900, I think. Um, and uh, okay, and then this, um, this you can re-express in terms of our tilted measures. So uh, under the integral, um, you, you can re-express that as uh, in terms of this uh, tilted probability measure. So we're sort of taking an average of this tilt, this tilted probability. Um, and then here we have this weight for the, uh, the tilted measure Q. Uh, so, so it, and, and then this free energy comes out. Okay, so at this point, we're sort of in a similar position as we were in with Cremer's theorem, where we have, this turns out to be kind of the answer uh, after, you modify, uh, after you optimize in theta. And then we have a factor here, a probability. Here it's sort of a two, two, two sort of at two levels, but it's a, it's something that we want to show is essentially one. Okay, so so we want to show that under these tilted measures, this becomes typical. Okay, so this is just to remind of our two families of tilted measures and and this expression we just derived. So this we have this sort of identity. So uh, for the upper bound, you can just trivially bound the second factor by one, um, and and we get this upper bound. Um, and this, by the way, is is always true. It's it's true. This is true in uh, not necessarily sharp subgaussian case, but um, but then it's actually turns out to usually not be sharp. Um, okay, but in the sharp subgaussian case. Uh, it's easy to show that this is bounded by theta squared. Uh, it turns out to be asymptotically theta squared, but it's certainly bounded just by a two-line computation using Fabini's theorem. Right? So this expected spherical integral, you take the expectation inside. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, this just factorizes by the independence of the entries, and then you, it, you, uh, you can express it in terms of this uh, log Laplace transform. And then we have the sharp subgaussian hypothesis that these are bounded by one half of the square of the argument. And so everything becomes quite clean at that point. Um, then you're just summing up these uh, the squares of the entries of the unit vector, uh, which just gives you one. Uh, and so after taking logs and dividing by n, you have this, this bound. Okay, so, so taking logs and dividing by n and then optimizing in theta, uh, you get this expression for the rate, well, at least as an upper bound, uh, and that turns out to be equal to this, this other expression I gave earlier for, for this Gaussian rate function, I gamma. Okay, so for the lower bound, um, what we need to do is show that this event is likely under these tilted measures where theta is the one we chose, uh, the, the optimizing parameter we chose. Um, and we at least need to do this, we have these two levels here. We need to do this at least for most u. So for all u in some sort of set I'll call D, which is typical under these tilted measures on the sphere. And uh, okay, so in the sharp subgaussian case, this turns out to work if you take D to be the set of vectors that are delocalized in this sense. So as long as the unit vectors, are, their components are uniformly bounded by something much smaller than n to the minus a quarter. Um, okay, well, so it's, it's not hard to show that that's typical. And moreover, for fixed U, under these tilted probability measures, you can compute this expectation of the matrix. Uh, so it, you know, it's 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 uh, it, you get it in terms of the derivative of the log Laplace transform. And since these are small, smaller than n to the minus a quarter, this argument is going to zero. And so just from Taylor expansion, uh, you get this expression here. Um, okay, and you can compute the variance, and you see that. Under this tilted measure, your matrix is essentially a rank one perturbation of another Wigner matrix. And so that means that you can do a BBP type uh, computation 
um, to, to see what's, what is the location, the largest eigenvalue for, for such a rank one perturbation. Uh, and you can find just, you know, just with the formula, you can find the, the right value of, of theta uh, that, that um, causes this, this event to be typical under these tilted measures. Okay, and and that's that's the that's the whole thing. So, so this is a um, this is a very nice argument. All right, so um, so let me just describe sort of what goes wrong, uh, some of the things that go wrong in in uh, when it's no longer sharp so Gaussian. Okay, so um, so uh, so so we can't use this this um, strategy in general, once localization phenomena can come out, um, because it turns out these, these possibilities, these localization possibilities cause this annealed free energy to just sort of be uh, too large. And it's not kind of, you can't use it to sort of get a, a, a sharp estimate on the tail. Um, okay, I'll skip this last point. So, um, so the key is, you know, now that the, the, the large deviations are, they're actually going to occur due to a mixture of localized and delocalized um, sort of strategies. Uh, and they'll, the, the, our, our idea is that these localized changes are going to be reflected by um, the associated eigenvector having some large entries. And so we're going to sort of uh, regularize the free energy by sort of uh, first fixing those large entries of the largest eigenvector. Okay, so um, I'll write L eta for the set of n to the one minus two eta sparse vectors in the ball. So this is going to be, these are um, going to be a, a, a sort of, um, these will approximate the large entries of the largest eigenvector. And so for a fixed vector in this set, uh, we're going to consider free energies that are restricted. So we're not going to integrate over the whole sphere. We'll just integrate over this sort of section of the sphere where we've essentially fixed the vector on this small support. Uh, being so it's approximated by w on this on its support so rho is some small parameter it's you know it's going to zero slowly um and then outside of this you know the um the the, the vector is delocalized so so this is a slice of the sphere where we've got the, the large entries of the of u are essentially given by w and otherwise it's delocalized and then we'll look at these uh so-called uh restricted annealed free energies so we don't integrate over the whole sphere. And so this is our main technical result is we get, um, so, so for the sharp sub Gaussian case, we had a similar expression like this, but it was uh, with the full free energy, annealed free energy. Now we can, we, our main result uh, captures the tail in terms of a supremum. So you take a supremum over W approximations for this uh, large, the large entries of this large and largest eigenvector, uh, and then take this, this optimization over these uh, restricted uh, annealed free energies. Okay, and then we, all right, so, so, and then we have sort of an overlap parameter Q, which is, uh, okay, so this turns out to be sort of the, the, um, the dot product between a sort of a typical uh, U and the uh, the top eigenvector of 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 H. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm uh, running out of time. So there's some. I think I'll. I, I already said some of this. Um, so. All right. So that's sort of a. Um, that gives sort of an independent sort of characterization of the tail. Um, we have another result which gives a formula, an asymptotic formula for these restricted annealed free energies um, of this form. Okay, so it's it's not not such an easy formula. Um, uh, okay, um, well, let let me show the formula in the context of the 
psi increasing. So from this formula, so, so it turns out that these restricted and yield free energies, if psi is increasing, um, it, uh, you know, for if you're restricting large entries to be approximately some vector w, you, you actually only, it increases if you sort of rotate w to put all of its mass on a single entry. And since we were taking a supremum over W, um, this uh, sort of disgusting optimization problem takes on a much simpler form in this case, um, and it no longer depends on N, and we actually get a full large deviation principle with this, uh, this explicit rate function here. Um, so, so when psi is increasing, we get, uh, we get this rate function of, of this form. So it, it's still a, you know, you've got an opti a minimax over two two parameters, um, but well, okay, it, it is what it is. Okay, um, all right, well, so I, you know, I, did, I, I had small hopes of, of getting to, to explaining this part, um, but uh, well, um, we're sort of modifying the, uh, the guillain Rousseau strategy uh, the key is to is to to find out how to restrict to these uh, to these um, these sets uh, uh, UW. Um, okay, but life is very difficult because you can no longer do a BBP computation because the vector isn't delocalized. Um, all right, but uh, well, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's quite technical, and if you know, I think there's a lot of people there are actually interested in this, and I'd be happy to. To, to chat sometime about the details. Um, but I think I'm out of time, so thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? So um, I, I had a few questions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, do you have uh, then the existence of the right function for any sub Gaussian distribution? Uh, yeah, so what we have it if, yeah, so apart from this case of the increasing psi, um, uh, we also have it if the, um, if psi achieves its maximum. Um, and, you know, I mean, so one of these two happens for any distribution you can think of, but it's not necessary. You know, I think you can come up with examples where it's, you know, not increasing, but also doesn't achieve its maximum. Um, so, so, so yes, we have the existence in this other case, um, such as the sparse Rademacher, um, where the maximum is is achieved at at some finite point. Um, and this is sort of comes from working with this expression. So this, I think we, we pursued this after, I think Ofer asked us about this at his birthday. Um, and uh, where is the expression? Yeah, so, so okay, so you have this, you know, the rate function, our, our theorem gives this sort of independent uh, formula for the tail. All right, so we also have to take the difference with this um, quenched free energy. Um, okay, but uh, you know, if it achieves its maximum, you can sort of um, you can show that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a it's a bit technical, but you can sort of massage it into something that's kind of monotone in N. You get a sort of monotone sequence, and 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 then deduce that it converges to something. Uh, but we don't we don't have a as clean uh, we don't have a clean formula for the limiting rate function. Um, we have hopes that you know when psi goes to zero, you know, so when psi is increasing, it's um, what's really happening is is that you're getting us. I mean, we also we have another result that says that the large Steigen vector actually has a single large component, um, and and that there should just be a single large entry in the matrix. Um, and that you know, and then some large-ish entries sort of on the corresponding row and column. Um, but in the sparse Rademacher case, you can't have a large entry 
Um, but what should be the case is that you have um, entries of some size, I think, n to the minus a quarter uh, on a sort of submatrix of size root root n. Um, and, and, and we do have some hope of, of showing that. So in the, in the general case that the, so that's safe for sparse Rademacher, but that, that should be generally the case if, if this psi function tends to zero at infinity. Um, with, you know, and that, that holds for any compactly supported uh, distribution. Um, so, so uh, but we haven't, we haven't uh, worked that out yet. And um, do you know what happens if the diagonal entries are not taken to be square root two, the off diagonal entries? Ah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. Um, I have, we haven't, we haven't thought much about this, but that's, that's, that's a nice question. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't, uh, we haven't thought about this question. And just a last question. So on, in your restricted, uh, annealed, uh, spherical integral, so, um, you have, so yeah, you have this vector W where you, that you restrict, uh, the spherical <laughs> annealed integral, but this W the only corresponds to the uh, localized entries of the top eigenvector. And how, how can mm -hmm. you, wh why is that? Why do you expect actually that, uh, uh, well, the, the annealed spherical integral, then then you, you make it concentrating on this vector vectors which have this uh, W part in them. Mm -hmm. But why do you expect that uh, it it concentrates on the on the top eigenvector? I mean, at least. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, so so you can show that. Um, I mean, it, you can show in general that uh, you know just for for a um, well in the quenched for the quenched uh, spherical integral. So this sort of J, this limiting formula J, you can actually show that that uh, that the spherical integral actually concentrates on a slice of the sphere um, where the um, the these vectors U are uh, have a certain angle. That's this Q parameter. They have a certain angle with the top eigenvector of the matrix. So if your matrix has a large eigenvalue. And it can have other eigen large eigenvalues too, but as long as there aren't too many eigenvalues sort of concentrated out towards the largest eigenvalue, you can show that actually the main contribution to a spherical integral is, is coming from the section of the sphere where the vectors have a certain angle with the top eigenvector. Um, and then if you're on an event where you fix the large components of the, of the eigenvector, uh, then you can show that you you know you you're essentially reduced to looking at at a set like this where you where you've um, um, where where the where the vector u is has a has a has a part that's fixed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, yes, and this uh, you know I think it's and then it, it and then it just kind of works out. <laughs> I mean, and you know, in hindsight, you can sort of see oh well, so the so the full annealed free energy was just had too much weight. On on these, uh, it, it was just sort of not giving a good idea of the tail because these um, uh, these large entries of U were carrying too much weight. But you know, once once you sort of fix W first, then everything kind of smooths out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it so it just works out once you once you restrict. But then you know you sort of have this double optimization problem of first optimizing theta and then optimizing W, and it's and it's kind of complicated in general. Uh, to see what's going on after you've got this formula. Are there any other questions? Um, and do you know if the rate function is, is convex after, because of now that you have this uh, infimum outside? Um. I think, oh, okay. Did we work this out in any exam? I think it isn't. Um, um, I don't, 
Yeah, I mean, so now, yeah, I mean, now we have this in femum, so I think, I think it's not, but, um, you, you know, we don't have a formula. Um, yeah, haven't, haven't been able to work out any specific examples, maybe for the sparse Gaussian case, this, this could be doable um, to work out exactly what it is. But yeah, I think in general, because you're taking this sort of minimum of convex functions, um it's not going to be you have a, you'll have a loss of convexity um which kind of explains why some you know previous approaches you know it, without doing this restriction it's not going to work i mean so the the sort of previous approach could only work if the uh if the rate function was ultimately going to be convex right yeah, as you know. <laughs> okay, then um, uh, let's then, if there are no other questions, then uh, let's uh, thank Nick again.